All right, welcome back to the deep dive. You guys know how this works by now. We take one awesome source and squeeze all the knowledge out of it, giving you a shortcut to get in the know. But uh, this time, we're not juggling a bunch of articles. We're diving deep into one single piece of foundational knowledge. That's right. We're looking at chapter one, units, physical quantities, and vectors from the classic textbook, University Physics with Modern Physics, Young and Ford. This is the foundation of physics. It's everything from like what even is physics to the mathematical language we use to talk about it. University physics, now that's a name that carries some weight. If anyone out there hasn't had the pleasure of experiencing it firsthand, Young and Ford well, they're pretty much the gurus of modern physics education for undergrads. This book, it's been around, it's always evolving, keeping up with how we understand the universe, you know, and how to teach it. So chapter one, it's not just dipping our toes in the water, it's building the foundation, the essential groundwork. We want you to walk away with a real, like, usable understanding of these core ideas. And it starts right off the bat, tackling the nature of physics. It makes a really important point. Physics is, at its heart, an experimental science. We look at the world around us, we see the patterns, and then we develop physical theories to try and explain those patterns. The thing is, a physical theory, it's not just some random idea. It's got to be tested. It's got to be checked against what we actually observe. And it's got to fit with those fundamental principles that we already accept. Like mm. the book even uses biological evolution as an example of tons of evidence gathered over like generations supporting that theory. So it's all about the evidence, not just speculation. And, you know, the chapter makes it clear getting to these theories. It's not always a straight line. There are dead ends, ideas that just don't work out. And we're always revising things as new data comes in. It's like a constant cycle. Observe, hypothesize, refine. Yeah, exactly. And this is key. No physical theory is ever set in stone like the ultimate absolute truth. You get one solid observation that contradicts the theory and boom, you got to modify it, maybe even scrap it all together. We might not be able to prove a theory right in every single possible situation, but we can definitely prove it wrong. And then the chapter goes on to talk about Galileo and his work on falling objects. You know, that classic story, maybe a little embellished, about him dropping stuff from the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Well, his experiments and his thinking led him to a huge discovery acceleration due to gravity. It doesn't depend on how much the object weighs. That's a cornerstone of classical mechanics, and it's still relevant in so many situations today. Really shows how physics is grounded in experiments. Then the chapter shifts gears, talking about solving physics problems. Might seem obvious, but the point here is understanding physics goes beyond just knowing the theories. It's about using those concepts to solve real problems, you know, taking those abstract ideas and making them concrete. And to do that, the chapter introduces a structured approach, a four-stage process they call IC, identify, set up, execute, and evaluate. It's all about being systematic. First, you figure out what the problem is asking and what information you have, identify. Then you plan out your solution, pick the right principles and equations, set up, you go through the math, execute. And finally, you check if your answer makes sense, if the units are right, evaluate. It's not just about getting the right number. It's about getting that deeper understanding. I like that. A nice systematic approach. Way better than just blindly plugging numbers into formulas. And then we get to the really foundational stuff. Standards and units. This section gets into why we need a standard system of measurement and how we use numbers and units to describe physical quantities. There are operational definitions, like defining length by, you know, using a ruler. And then there are definitions based on calculations, which often rely on these fundamental constants. And what's crucial here is the idea of reference standards units that are constant and that everyone can reproduce. Think about it. A meter in one lab has to be the exact same length as a meter in a lab across the world, otherwise we can't do science together and our results wouldn't be accurate. So the chapter introduces the SI, the International System of Units, the standard that scientists and engineers use everywhere. And this is where we get into the core building blocks, the SI base units. The chapter dives into how we define three essential ones, time, length, and mass. Time, the second, is now defined so precisely using a cesium-133 atomic clock. It's based on like how many cycles of microwave radiation are emitted during a very specific energy transition in the cesium atom. It's mind-blowing how precise this is, and it's completely revolutionized things like GPS and global communication networks. Yeah, it's incredible. This atomic definition replaced the older one, which was based on the Earth's rotation, and that was prone to tiny variations. Atomic clocks, they're just unbelievably accurate. Right. Then we have length, the meter. Now, it's defined using the speed of light in a vacuum, a fundamental constant. 
One meter is the distance that light travels in a very, very tiny fraction of a second. This ties the meter to a fundamental constant, making it even more universal and stable than any physical object could be. And last but not least, there's mass, the kilogram. The chapter talks about the old definition, that platinum iridium cylinder kept in France, and the more recent change, defining it based on Planck's constant. That's a fundamental constant from quantum mechanics, describing the quantized nature of energy. Now, the gram, it's a common unit for mass, but the chapter points out it's actually derived from the kilogram. It's not a base unit itself. This shift to a quantum constant, it's a huge step towards a standard that's more fundamental and accessible to everyone. Right, it's about getting to the heart of these units. These new definitions, based on atomic properties and fundamental constants, they're way more universal and reproducible than using physical objects. Now, the chapter does mention the British system of units, feet, pounds, seconds. It's still used in some places, especially the U.S., but even those units are now officially defined in terms of the SI system. So even if we still see inches and pounds in our daily lives, the scientific world is all about the SI system. And to deal with the huge range of physical quantities out there, we have the SI prefixes kilo, milli, micro, nano, and so on. They're basically multipliers, powers of 10, that help us write really big or really small numbers in a more compact way. Exactly. A kilometer is 10 to the power of 3 meters, a millimeter is 10 to the power of minus 3 meters, and so on. The chapter gives lots of examples for length, mass, and time, so you can really get a feel for those scales from nanometers to micrograms. All right, now that we've got the basics of units down, the chapter moves on to using and converting units. This is where things get practical. It stresses that when we use algebraic symbols and equations, those symbols, they're not just numbers. They represent both a numerical value and a unit. You can't just ignore the units. And that leads to the idea of dimensional consistency, a really important principle. If you're adding or equating terms in an equation, those terms have to have the same units. It's a way to check if your equation makes sense, like the classic distance equals speed times time, or d equals vt. If distance is in meters, then speed, which is meters per second times time, which is in seconds, has to also give you meters. If the units don't match, something's probably wrong. Like a built-in error checker. The chapter is really clear about this. Always keep your units throughout your calculations and treat them like algebraic quantities that you can cancel or combine. That brings us to the skill of unit conversion using unit multipliers. You take the equivalence between two units and express it as a ratio. Super useful in physics and engineering. The chapter takes you through a simple example, converting three minutes to seconds. Shows you how the minutes cancel out, leaving you with seconds. Then it gets into a more involved example, converting the volume of the first star of Africa diamond from cubic inches to cubic centimeters and then cubic meters. This shows that when you're dealing with something raised to a power, like volume, which is length cubed, you got to raise the conversion factor to that same power. That diamond example really brings those three-dimensional unit conversions to life. Next up, we have uncertainty and significant figures. This is all about dealing with the real world where measurements are never perfect. Right. There's always some degree of uncertainty or error. The number of significant figures we use tells us how much uncertainty there is. More significant figures means a more precise measurement, so less uncertainty. The chapter lays out the rules for figuring out how many significant figures a number has, including how to deal with zeros. So 2.91 millimeters has three significant figures, meaning there's some uncertainty in the hundredths place. But 0.25 kilometers, that only has two significant figures. And then there are rules for what happens to significant figures when you do math. For multiplication and division, the result can't have more significant figures than the factor with the fewest. And for addition and subtraction, you look at the decimal places. The result has the same number of decimal places as the term with the fewest. The chapter emphasizes rounding your final answer correctly to reflect the right number of significant figures. And there's an example using Einstein's famous equation EMCPA, where the speed of light is a constant that's known very precisely. It's all about acknowledging and showing the limitations of our measurement. So we always got to be mindful of the precision of our data. Now, the next section, estimates and orders of magnitude. This is about making rough calculations, maybe when you don't have precise data or the calculation will be too complicated to do exactly. These are called order of magnitude estimates, sometimes Fermi problems. They're super helpful for getting a quick idea of things or checking if a more detailed calculation is even in the right ballpark. Even if your estimate is off by a factor of 10, it can still give you valuable information about the scale of something. The chapter has this cool example trying to figure out if you could carry a billion dollars worth of gold in a suitcase. 
By estimating the density and price of gold, you quickly realize it's just not possible. The mass would be way too much. That's a fun way to think about scales in the physical world. And now we move into a whole new way of describing physical quantities, vectors and vector addition. The chapter makes a clear distinction between scalar quantities, which are just about magnitude, like temperature or mass, and vector quantities, which need both magnitude and direction, like velocity or force. Right. And the important thing is, combining vectors isn't the same as just adding or subtracting numbers. The chapter uses displacement as an example, a change in position. It matters how far you moved and in what direction. Then it goes into how we write vectors and how they're represented graphically as arrows, where the length is the magnitude and the arrowhead shows the direction. And that leads us to vector addition. The chapter explains the head-to-tail method, where you put the tail of one vector at the head of the other, and the resultant vector, the sum, goes from the tail of the first to the head of the last. It also shows that it doesn't matter which order you add the vectors, you get the same result. You can add more than two vectors graphically using the polygon method. It's basically the head-to-tail method with more vectors. And then there's vector subtraction, which is like adding the negative of a vector. That just means a vector with the same magnitude but pointing in the opposite direction. Example 1.5, a problem about a ski trip with two displacements, shows how to add perpendicular vectors visually using the Pythagorean theorem and trigonometry to find the resultant displacement. Yeah, that ski trip example really helps to visualize how those displacements add up. Then we dive into components of vectors. This is a powerful tool. It lets us work with vectors mathematically by breaking them down into their projections along the axes. The chapter explains how to resolve a vector into its x and y components using trigonometry. The x component is usually found using the cosine of the angle the vector makes with the x-axis and the y component using the sine. But those components, they're just numbers. They're scalars, not vectors. And the chapter points out that these specific trigonometric relationships depend on how the angle is defined. And you can also do the reverse if you know the x and y components. You can find the magnitude of the vector using the Pythagorean theorem and its direction using the arctangent function. But the chapter warns you the arctangent function can be a little tricky. You've got to be careful about the quadrant of the vector to get the right angle. And then it extends this concept to three dimensions where a vector have x, y, and z components. So by breaking vectors down into their components, we can do vector addition and subtraction by just adding or subtracting those components. Building on this idea, the chapter introduces unit vectors. These are special vectors, magnitude of one, no units, they just show direction. The standard ones in a Cartesian coordinate system are i, sometimes d, for the x-axis, j or e for the y-axis, and k or n for the knee-axis. The chapter shows how to write any vector in terms of its components and these unit vectors. So a vector a in three dimensions can be written as ax i plus aj plus as k. This makes vector addition and subtraction super easy. You just add or subtract the corresponding components. Example 1.8 shows how to manipulate vectors using this notation. Unit vectors, a nice, elegant way to represent vectors mathematically. And finally, the chapter gets into products of vectors. Since vectors aren't just numbers, there are two ways to define their product, both important. The first one is the scalar product, also called the dot product. You take two vectors, and the result is a scalar, just a number. The chapter gives two ways to define it as the product of the magnitudes of the vectors and the cosine of the angle between them, or in terms of the components a's bx plus a by plus a b's. Example 1.9 shows how to calculate the scalar product using both ways. The scalar product is super useful for finding the component of one vector that's parallel to another, and it's key in defining concepts like work. And the other one is the vector product, also called the cross product. This time you take two vectors and the result is another vector. The magnitude of the cross product is the product of the magnitudes of the original vectors and the sine of the angle between them. The chapter introduces the right-hand rule to figure out the direction of the resulting vector. It's always perpendicular to the plane containing the two original vectors. The direction depends on the order of the vectors in the cross product, so AAB points in the opposite direction to BAA. And there's a way to write the cross product in terms of components using a determinant, which makes it easy to calculate when you know the components. Example 1.10 shows how to do that. The magnitude of the cross product tells you about the component of one vector that's perpendicular to the other, and the direction is perpendicular to both. This is essential for defining things like torque and magnetic force later on. That wraps up Chapter 1. It covers a lot, from the nature of physics and problem-solving strategies, to all the different operations with vectors. It mentions the solution guide in visual problem-solving techniques in the chapter, referencing an example with an air conditioning unit on a roof. 
And of course, it points out the practice problems, questions, and exercises at the end of the chapter, as well as the learning to learn and to the instructor sections, which are super helpful for studying physics effectively. That's a seriously thorough exploration of chapter one. From the language of physics itself, units and measurements, how we quantify the world to the awesome math of vector analysis, describing motion and forces in three dimensions. This chapter sets the stage, lays the groundwork. It's clear how important these seemingly basic concepts are for understanding everything that comes next. Mechanics, thermodynamics, electromagnetism, optics, modern physics, even biological systems. It's not just theory, though. Throughout the chapter, we saw those real-world connections, the precision of atomic clocks in modern tech, the meter being tied to the speed of light, those unit conversions with the first star of Africa diamond, and using vectors to solve a real-world problem with an air conditioning unit. Understanding units, significant figures, and vectors, it's not just for physics and engineering. These are essential skills for anyone working with numbers in any scientific or technical field, even in our daily lives, making informed decisions. It's amazing, right? The language of physics, with its defined units and its math tools, gives us this incredibly powerful framework to understand the world, even when things seem messy and uncertain. It makes you wonder when in your daily life does understanding the difference between a scalar and a vector really matter? Or how about using that problem-solving approach we talked about? Identify, set up, execute, evaluate. How could you apply that to challenges you face in your work, in your studies, even in your personal life? Keep exploring these ideas. Maybe check out some of those more advanced topics mentioned in the book. Think about how these concepts really form the basis of our entire understanding of the universe. Thanks for joining us for another deep dive.